So we're here today to talk about accessibility. Uh, I think I'm introing myself, uh, which is fine. So hi, uh, I'm Ben Byrne. I'm a founding partner of Corner Shop Creative. We're a team of about 17, I think right now, uh, distributed all across the country. And we help nonprofits be successful online. Uh, mostly that means building WordPress websites, but it also means data integrations and CRM implementations and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, my role as founding partners, uh, like we're not big on titles, but I'm more or less the sort of the director of engineering. Uh, so I really oversee the developers as they're doing their work. And I also tend to have my fingers in a lot of the creative and UX stuff as well, since that's my original training. Um, accessibility is not a huge part of my day job, but it's something that I care a lot about. And so that's why I'm here. I'm happy to have you here. Hopefully you care a lot about it too, uh, or you will at the end of the talk. Um, so, to get started, um, I just wanted to really quickly define accessibility. If you're here, you probably know what I'm talking about, but if not, um, accessibility is just sort of the degree to which a product, device, service, or environment uh, is available to as many people as possible. Um, in the context that we're talking here, we're talking mostly websites, although a lot of what I'm about to say um, is relevant to things other than websites. If you're working on mobile apps or any of that sort of stuff, you, you know, the issues are very similar, um, and honestly, for things in the physical world, too. But I'm focused today on websites and WordPress and that kind of stuff. Um, also, really quickly, um, if you've seen this floating around before, accessibility is A11Y. Um, that's because people in tech are very lazy and don't, write to, don't like to write long words like localization or internationalization or accessibility. Um, so we drop letters and instead put numerals in. So you will see me mix A11Y and accessibility in various slides in this talk. It's not some cool, weird code word. It's just a shorthand because we're lazy. So, um, yes, now that we've kind of got that cleared up, um, I, before I get into you know, too many of the details um, about um, how you can even address accessibility issues and how you should think about them on your site and that sort of thing, um, the first thing I want to do actually is to try to clean up some misunderstandings um, about who accessibility is relevant to um, and sort of why you should care about it a little bit um, because some people sort of compartmentalize mentalize a little bit uh, around this, and uh, I think that's not good. So. Um the point I really want to make here is that accessibility issues are really, really common. Um, I've seen some people try to like do some research and come up with numbers that like one in five people has an accessibility issue using the net or visiting your site or something like that. I don't know where that data is coming from, how they're computing that, what they're counting as accessibility issues. It's really hard to pin down a percentage. Um, you know, if you're looking at something very specific, like you want to know what percentage of your site visitors are using a screen reader, you might be able to pin that down. But like, you don't know who's out in the wild doing what with your site. So like, don't focus on the numbers necessarily, um, but focus on the ideas that we're talking about here. Um, and really, the the point I want to underscore the most is that a lot of people, when they hear accessibility, they think about like, this is for people with permanent disabilities. Like, I need to make sure my site is usable by someone who is blind, uh, or something like that. But it's really, it's not quite that simple. Accessibility affects us all, basically, um, all the time. In their lots of different circumstances. Um, and there are sort of, uh, to me, I think there are sort of four major categories where accessibility sort of comes into play. Um, so the first one, the first sort of category of, of impairments where accessibility starts to become an issue um, is visual impairment. Um, so the common one I just mentioned, blindness. That's like the really obvious, like, OK, if I'm blind, I'm not going to see your website. Um, but there are plenty of people who just have poor vision. Um, they might you know, be using their browser with the text zoom jacked way up or or something like that so they can read things better. Um, there are plenty of people who have color blindness. Um, you know, they can see and operate on a day-to-day -day basis, but like, you know, they're not going to actually be able to tell where that button stops and ends because it's on some other colored background or something like that. Um, but also, like this slide sort of demonstrates here, there are all sorts of visual impairments that can happen very, very temporarily, like screen glare. Um, you know, I was out at lunch yesterday, right? We're all sitting in the park, and my wife sent me a picture from the zoo. She was taking the kids to the zoo. And was like, here, find the snow leopard in the zoo enclosure. And I'm like, I'm out in the sun, like pinching and zooming, trying to find the snow leopard. I mean, it was supposed to be hard to find anyway, right? But um, the point was, it was like, at that moment, I had an accessibility issue. Um, and I think probably all of us have been under some circumstance for one reason or another, where like we were suffering a visual impairment because of something external to us. 
uh, the next category uh, of impairments that we usually try to think about uh, is motor impairments. Um, so these can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes as well. Um, you know, people may have tremors, slowness, uh, you know, they might suffer from Parkinson's, muscular dystrophy, uh, something like that. They may have had a stroke, um, or they might have been drinking, uh, and suddenly they're not so precise with their taps on their phone, and they swipe the wrong direction on Tinder by accident, or something like that, right? Like, um, exhaustion can be another one. Like, a lot of people, maybe, you know, we visiting your site late at night, I've got two little kids, you know, I tend to surf the web a little bit before bed, and like, uh, my brain is not working at 100% when I'm doing that. Um, and that's that's an impairment. I, you know, my, my hands are not working the way they need to, my brain's not working the way it needs to. Another category is auditory, auditory impairment. Um, this is one you might not think of when you're thinking about your website. Um, but if you've got video or you're a podcaster or something like that, like multimedia, this is relevant. This is a category of impairment. Um, you know, again, the obvious like one that comes to mind is most you know somebody suffering from deafness uh, or partial hearing loss. Um, but there's also hyper, uh, hyperacusis, right, where you have or tinnitus, something like that, where you're actually very sensitive to sound or have background sounds going on or something like that like it's not just that you can't hear as well um, also my favorite temporary classic example here is grandpa with the sleeping baby um, if you've ever thought if you've ever had a client ask you for their video to autoplay show them this slide like this is like there are reasons why you don't do some of these things I'll talk more about them um, but like you know this user in this particular circumstance is not going to be able to listen to something at high volume uh, it's temporary but it's still an impairment and it's something that if you care about accessibility you should care about somebody in the circumstance uh, the last sort of big category I think of really is cognitive. Um, so this is people that may have developmental disabilities. Um, dyslexia sort of is considered to be a cognitive impairment. Um, ADD or ADHD can be considered a cognitive impairment. Um, also just being really distracted. Uh, you know, you're trying to use your phone or your laptop and, you know, send somebody an email or talk to somebody on Slack while you're listening to a WordCamp talk, for example. Um, you may be slightly impaired and not listening very closely to what your colleagues are writing and answer wrong or something like that. Um, you also might be really, really, really tired, as this cat is. Um, you also might actually be a cat, because um, I certainly have seen cats walk across my colleagues' keyboards and wind up sending me messages in Slack. Um, but uh, the point here is, is that there are plenty of reasons, both permanent and temporary, why somebody might be suffering from a cognitive impairment in some way. Um, so when you, please, 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 when you think about accessibility, don't just assume it's somebody with a permanent condition and like that's some audience you're trying to reach. Like that is hugely important, but that is not the only audience that you need to care about. There are lots of temporary reasons, so there's probably, the point here is that there's actually accessibility maybe more of an issue than you're giving it credit for. Um, because there's a larger segment of the audience that's experiencing things that you may not be considering. Um, so that gives me to sort of this other question of, okay, so why should you care about accessibility? Why, why care about some of these like people on the periphery or maybe that person should just go inside to use their phone to look at the picture of the snow leopard at the zoo or something like that. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for this. I mean, sort of in like here, I've got four sort of in decreasing, <laughs> decreasing levels of warm fuzziness. Um, basically, I mean, the first is just sort of like a general simple humanity. Um, you know, I could argue that this is this is ethics, right? This is just respecting the desire another person has to experience your content and making it available in the way that they can experience it that. Um, I mean, it's pretty basic. Like, to me, this is kind of a moral issue a little bit, right? That like you're excluding people um, probably, possibly because of something outside of their control. Uh, and to me, that's, that's not like a really happy thing. Um, to put it in slightly more practical terms, um, you're losing audience, right? That like, you know, anytime you build something that's inaccessible to some segment of the population for whatever reason, um, if they can't use it, if they can't see it, if they can experience it, they're not. Um, and, you know, it's like, I don't think anybody, you know, I don't know anybody that would try to build a website, like, specifically that, like, only people of a certain gender could use, or only people, you know, who are standing could use it instead of those who are sitting or something like that. Like, um, most of us want to reach as wide an audience as possible um, from a pragmatic standpoint. Um, and so accessibility factors into that. You're excluding people by not thinking about accessibility. Your audience is smaller than it would otherwise be. 
Um, increasingly less warm and fussy, but uh, arguably by some people just as important, um, is your search engine stuff. Um, this ties, you know, all of these, of course, are interlinked, right? But um, search engines are, are basically su suffer from impairments. They're not humans. They're not actually viewing your site. They're like spiders that are scraping and that sort of stuff. So they're experiencing your site in a sort of impaired way, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and a lot of accessibility best practices, stuff I'll be talking about later here, um, are things that actually have a nice sort of side effect of boosting your SEO. Um, because if you're doing them for accessibility reasons, the spiders, the crawlers, the indexers are actually getting at better, more content on your site. Um, so you're helping yourself and you're helping your SEO um, if you're caring about accessibility. Um, that's a, a kind of a crummy motivation, I think, really, in some ways. But like, you should care more about the people, but it's a nice side benefit. Um, and then the last one, I mean, we want to get really, like, really sort of crass about it, is financial. Um, and I mean this sort of on a couple of fronts. Um, at Corner Shop, we work with nonprofits almost exclusively. Um, a lot of those may be getting government grants, uh, or even if not, even private grants or something like that, that have strings attached that say, if you're building a website, it needs to be accessible. It needs to meet the standard or this criteria. Uh, and if that's not baked into the process, if that's not somebody somebody's thinking about at the end, they can get in trouble for that. Um, you know, that getting in trouble can be any number of things. It can be withdrawal of the grant money, that sort of thing. Um, also, if you're a large organization accepting government money or something like that, you may be like, you know, you may be required to comply with the ADA. You may be subject to lawsuits if you are really dropping the ball on accessibility. Um, I don't have the numbers on, you know, how many lawsuits a year happen and that sort of thing, um, but it does happen. Um, organizations do get sued for failing to build accessible websites. Um, so if, for, if these other reasons haven't convinced you that you should be kind to your fellow person, at the very least, uh, think about the bottom line, I suppose, if you have to. If that's the only way to get you to think about it, um, that, that could light a fire under some people who otherwise uh, may be reluctant to spend money on accessibility or something like that. Um, so I mentioned, like with the government funding and that sort of stuff, um, meeting standards. Um, and this is where I think a lot of people who are just getting started in accessibility um, really start to get a little confused or a little concerned or a little bewildered um, because, ironically, a lot of the standards are not very accessible in the sense that they can be very esoteric and confusing. Um, the two that you hear the most are Section 508 and WC3 WCAG or WCAG, I've heard it pronounced in a different ways, uh, 2.0. Um, Section 508 uh, is a provision of the Federal Rehabilitation Act um, that requires that um, website content be accessible to people with disabilities. Um, Section 508 has basically um, evolved into saying you need to conform to WCAG 2.0 level AA. Um, Section 508 is because it's from the federal government, it's you know specific to the United States and that sort of thing. Uh, WCAG 2.0 is more general. It's not. It's, it's not coming out of a regulation. It's now that the regulation sort of points to the WCAG. Um, so WCAG 2.0 is the one you probably will hear the most about and most people talking about. And if they're talking about Section 508, they're probably really talking about this now. Um, what's interesting for WCAG, so WCAG is the, I don't even remember what the acronym means. It's um, web. the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, yes. Um, and that's from the World Wide Web Consortium. That's the W3C. Um, so it comes in three different levels, A, AA, and AAA. Um, uh, and those three different levels are basically increasing levels of rigor uh, around standards you need to meet and like things your site needs to do and all that sort of stuff. Um, one of the points I'm going to make in this talk a couple of times, I'm going to make it now for the first time, um, is that accessibility, like you can spend a lot of time and money conforming to a written standard like this, um, and that can be very, very important for a lot of reasons. Um, but like accessibility is, it like depends on context. Um, and they can write all these rules and give you all these requirements and you can say, yes, I've met them. Every image has an alt tag or whatever it is. Um, but that doesn't actually speak to the end user's experience. Um, you know, the only really way to know if your site is really accessible is to test and use it and have somebody try to experience it. Um, and the reason I mention this now is because, like, WCAG has these three levels. Um, level A is sort of the easiest to meet. Um, and it's the one that I, I, I haven't met any 
any organization, we haven't gotten any client proposals or anything like that that say they want to meet A. Um, I think it's a reasonably low bar, um, and people are sort of expected to clear it without even having to say it out loud. Um, double A is the one that everybody really tends to focus on. Um, this is the one that like Section 508 references. Um, this is the one that lots of our clients come to us with needing to meet. Um, you know, we've built, we're building a site for the National Park Service that needs to meet double A. Um, what's interesting to me is that there is a triple A. There's this even more stringent, higher standard of triple A. Um, but basically nobody feels compelled to meet that standard. And I think the reason for that is because people recognize that being that sort of proscriptive and didactic about so many little details, that like when you're getting to that level of like sort of quantitative criteria, it's actually hard to know if those are helping. Um, because contact is so important, because the way your site works, the way your site is designed, um, that going that extra little mile for some of those things, it might be important. It's probably not a bad idea. Um, but that AAA is actually not the level people are trying to achieve. They want to achieve AA um, and then test their site and make sure that it's actually good for the users that they're concerned about. Um, so not that I'm discouraging you from going the extra mile to achieve AAA, but it's just sort of worth noting here that even within the industry, the sort of accepted standard is the middle one because there's an understanding that context matters. Quick note, uh, in case you're uh, following the news on this sort of stuff, um, WCAG 2.1 was released in early June. Um, I don't know yet how, how quickly that's being adopted. I certainly haven't talked to anybody who's like said to us, yes, we need to meet 2.1. Um, but this is, you know, like everything else in our space, these rules change. Um, 2.1 um, provides 17 additional success criteria on top of 2.0. Um, it doesn't change anything in 2.0. It just adds 17 more things. Um, so it's not like you need to go back and like back off some changes to meet 2.1 or they've changed anything else. They just added some things. Um, there's a link in here if you want to go to that URL. Um, there's you know documentation on what those 17 things are. Um, it specifically, I believe, targets some things around mobile, uh, talks around things with low vision, and then some other stuff around um, cognitive and learning disabilities. Um, so it's like it's not a. I don't think it's a huge major change, but just so you're in the know, you can go home and tell everybody that like 2.1 is now a thing. Maybe we should start paying attention to that uh, and seeing how quickly that sort of gains traction in the community. All right, so now that I've sort of talked about some of the standards and some of the stuff to think about and what counts as accessibility issues, uh, I'd like to go over some basic best practices. Um, this is, again, this is just the basics. This is not, the, if you follow all of the, everything I say up here, I don't know that you will meet level AA. Um, this is just, again, we're, this is beginning the journey. This is an intro talk, so this is just stuff to be aware of. Um, the first thing I want to say, um, the, the easiest thing to start with is thinking about your site in a text-only environment. Um, strip away the designs, strip away the images. What does that experience become? Um, and there are some very basic things you can do here to make that experience much better. Um, the first one is using alt tags and title tags. <laughs> well, technically they're attributes. Um, alts for images, titles for links. Um, these are really, really important things, really basic things things that you should be able to do, that your developer should be able to do. Um, this is this should be a pretty low bar to clear. Um, the one thing I do want to call out here, this link here, is that um, there's sort of an art and a science to writing good alt tags. Um, I mean, having something is better than having nothing, for sure. Um, but there are, you know, not all, not all good alt attributes are created equal. Um, again, context matters. If you have an image that has a caption underneath it and your markup is semantic, your alt tag can probably be very short. If you follow this link, there's actually a circumstance under which they recommend an empty alt tag, that you have the attribute there and that it be empty because the caption is performing the role. If your markup is right and the caption is there, it can do it. Um, there are other circumstances where, depending on context, if there's no caption and the reason that that picture is there is a, is a non-obvious reason, the text you write might actually be different than a literal description of the image. It might actually explain some context of why that image is there or something about that image. Um, so this link, I think, is great if you really want to 
get good at writing good alt tags, uh, I highly recommend spending some time skimming skimming this over and understanding um, the different contexts uh, in which your alt tag might be appearing. Um, this can be challenging if you've got an image where like the WordPress media library, you write that alt tag once and it lives in the media library, but then that image could be appearing a bunch of different places in a bunch of different contexts on your site. Um, this can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, in that case, you probably want to err on the side of having a more thorough alt tag sort of just in case. That's probably better to be slightly redundant than to be short on providing information. Anyway, um, another text-only consideration um, is keyboard navigability. Uh, and sort of attached to that is this idea of being mindful of the tab index. Who here knows what the tab index is? Does anybody? Oh, a lot of people. Awesome. Excellent. Um, so if you don't know, the tab index is an attribute in your HTML um, that you can set if you want to, um, to specify basically the order that that item should be tabbed to if somebody is using the tab key to navigate through your site. Um, if you don't specify tab indexes anywhere it just sort of goes you know through the markup and markup order to each you know each link and each you know interactive element on the site um, if you set a tab index you can make something that appears at the bottom actually be like the first thing that gets highlighted when you hit tab um, there are good reasons to do that there are bad reasons to do that um, there are some plugins like gravity forms and stuff like that that may try to set tab indexes on form elements and stuff like that for you um, sometimes that's helpful sometimes that's wrong that it's guessing wrong because it doesn't understand that there are other forms on the page or other nav or something like that. Um, but thinking of your tab index, just trying to visit your site and tab through it uh, can be a great thing. You know, a lot of times we can do some really amazing stuff with like CSS and Flexbox and Grid and all that kind of stuff that um, the order stuff appears in your markup is very different than the order it appears to someone actually viewing it. Um, and you should try to think about your tab index and how you might need to muck with that if you can um, to make it sort of a more friendly experience. Um, related to that is a skip to content link. Um, this is something, if you if you don't have experience with this, you might have actually just seen this surfing the web. Like you've hit a web page and before like the CSS is finished loading, you've seen this little skip to content link that's then disappeared. Um, this is just sort of a helper thing for text only nav that basically um, if somebody is visiting your site and they want to get to something further down to like, you know, they've got a screen reader and they want to read the main body of the article of the page, um, but they don't want to have to hit tab 32 times to get through all of your menus and submenus at the top of the page. The skip to content link is there sort of at the beginning of the markup and somebody with a screen reader can tap on that or use that to skip over and not have to tab through all of your junk in your header to get to the actual main part of your site. Um, so that's just sort of another best practice. Um, it's pretty easy if you've got a starter theme or something like that to include that, build that, hide that the right way in CSS, um, but that it's there for screen readers and they can jump to the content. Um, speaking of hiding things in CSS and having stuff in different orders depending on your markup and your styling, um, another really important thing, and this is where you can probably start to see how um, like SEO and accessibility issues might relate, um, is using semantic HTML5. Um, you know, if something is a nav bar, use the nav element. Uh, if something is an aside, use the aside element. Um, if it's the main part of the page, you know, make sure it's main. You know, this can make a big difference in terms of how um, you know limited accessibility systems might be parsing your page and helping people navigate to the parts of the page that are relevant to them. Um, so this makes a big difference in SEO. Um, this also makes a big difference in accessibility. Um, similar to those semantic tags um, is being mindful of your H1 through H6. I mean, this all sort of goes into the, the idea of a document outline, um, if you're familiar with that. That has SEO relevance. It also has accessibility re relevance. Um, try to build your document structure in a, in a good way that's meaningful in terms of your use of these tags um, so that you know, they do indicate sort of the structure of what somebody is looking at. Um, if you've got something that's, uh, you know, a little more interactive, is more of a web app, there's interface components that are changing states and all that kind of stuff, um, uh, your document should probably uh, go start getting into ARIA roles. Um, these are not stuff I'm going to talk a lot about here, um, but I want you to know that they exist. Um, this is sort of extra attributes that you can put onto your, your markup uh, to indicate the role or the function of that thing. Um, so you can explain why, you know, if there's a little icon in the corner, the ARIA role can sort of indicate why that icon
icon is there and what function that's for. Um, somebody who can just view your site can probably intuit that from looking at the layout of your site, um, but somebody using your site you know, under a different system and not viewing it the, you know, sort of the way your designer assumed it would be looked at um, can sort of figure out what that piece of markup is there for, what it's, what's it, what it's meant to do, what it is doing, that sort of thing. Um, so ARIA roles, if you've got something interactive, uh, can be something that is worth spending some time learning more about. In terms of the design, getting away from sort of the, the text-only thinking and, and some of the semantic stuff I was talking about, um, is thinking about things like contrast ratios and font sizes. Um, WKAG 2.0 has a bunch of guidelines and rules for this, so I'll talk about a tool in a little bit that can help you assess this. Um, but basically, there are rules that you should follow about, you know, don't put dark gray text on a middle gray background. Um, you know, you can maybe read that on your gorgeous, you know, iMac 27-inch 5K display. Display, uh, but somebody with a laptop with the screen tilted at the wrong angle, there's going to be no difference between those two colors. Um, that sort of thing. Um, along those lines, um, use more than just color to denote differences, emphasis, content, meaning, that sort of thing. A lot of times designers will, you know, sort of color code stuff on your site to sort of imply what section it belongs to or that sort of thing. Um, color is great. Um, color is, is sort of insufficient on its own. Uh, the metaphor I like to think about here is like if you're parking in a parking garage, um, you've probably been in a garage where there was a color and a number and a letter or something like that to sort of key you to where your car was. Um, I've never seen one that just used colors. Um, you shouldn't just use color. You should also have something else along with you, with your color to, to provide that indicator. Uh, and then the last thing I want to say here is just as a pet peeve of myself, sort of as a front end guy, um, is if you've got, you know, a design that calls for like your headlines to be in all caps or something like that, use CSS to make that display in all caps. Don't actually write that in all caps. Um, there's there's no need to shout, basically. Like, if your design is doing it in a way that it doesn't look like shouting, that's great. I design stuff like that all the time. But you shouldn't actually need to type in all caps when you've got, like, long strings of text that are capitalized. This is, I don't know how huge of an accessibility this is, but it just drives me nuts as, like, a developer. So, anyway. Also, in terms of your content, outside of your design, outside of your markup, that sort of stuff, um, you need to be thoughtful about your content for good accessibility. Um, that means using good titles, using good headers, um, using link text to provide context. Um, the worst example here is click here. Um, try to never ever make the words click here a link. That provides no context for what you're going to get without having to read the text before or after it. Um, and it's actually, it's not uncommon for people to have a screen reader configured to only only read the links on the page. Um, there's so much cruft on so many websites these days that it's, it, you know, if you talk to people, it's not unusual for them to just say, just give me the links. Uh, and if, you, if you're doing your links to just say, click here, you're going to have like five click here's in a row, and none of them are going to have any implication for what they are, why they're there, that sort of thing. Uh, I also see this a lot of time actually in emails, like down at the bottom for unsubscribe. It's like, if you want to unsubscribe, come a click here. And there's like four other click here's in that footer of like, if you want to tell a friend, click here, and that sort of thing. And it's like, it's so much easier just for me, even without accessibility issues, to find the unsubscribe link if it's, it's the word unsubscribe is the link, not the words click here. Um, so that's an important one. Um, similarly, um, in terms of layout, you know, because, I mean, first of all, we live in a responsive world where something that's at the left might actually wind up being underneath. Um, but train your content team to think about this and to not say these things like see picture below, see sidebar above, that sort of stuff. You're, you know, you're implying that this is being presented presented in a certain visual way that it may not be, um, you know, particularly in, you know, like if you're trying to syndicate content, you don't even, you know, it's showing up at Apple News for all you know or something like that. Like, um, don't reference things by, you know, color or position or that sort of stuff because that may not actually be the way it's always going to appear to somebody. In terms of media, rich media, this is where things get really challenging a lot of times for accessibility. Um, the first one, I mentioned this already, no autoplay ever. Don't wake the sleeping baby. Just don't do it. Um, if possible, always provide some sort of captions um, for any video, audio, or other sort of rich media you've got. Um, 
If you're like a podcaster, you provide webinars. Um, it's also not a bad idea if you have transcripts, if you have those written descriptions, to actually put those in the page, um, just below the video or something like that. That's actually usually a pretty good thing for SEO. Uh, I mean, you can make it a downloadable link or something like that, like you provide it in some way, shape, or form, but oftentimes it's a good idea to just have it right on the page. Um, and then lastly, another pet peeve of mine is this no images of text. Uh, I see this a lot with people with WordPress sites that are running like uh, like Revolution Slider, or I don't know, some sort of slider thing where they haven't, the system doesn't really support like overlaying true HTML text on top of like a banner image. So they just in Photoshop put the text in and save that out as a JPEG. Um, first of all, just like as a designer who is like on a retina screen, I can see when that's happening and it just looks bad. It just sort of drives me nuts. Um, but it's also, it's just, it's not good for accessibility. It's not good for SEO. I've had people say, oh well, yeah, but I can just take that headline and make that the alt text. And it's like, well, you can, and that's better than nothing, but really the alt text is supposed to describe the image and your text should be text. This is sort of my rule is pictures should be pictures and text should be text. If you can avoid putting text in your actual images, you should avoid that. Uh, lastly, um, just for if you're writing code, uh, I, I highly recommend to um, somewhere in your pages indicate that your site is in English, uh, or if it's not in English, what language it is in, um, just to provide some guidance there. Um, don't have major errors in your code. Open up your pages in you know Google Console. Um, you know you may see some JavaScript errors, and you think, oh well, it's not affecting the page. It's no big deal. I'm just gonna I don't care about those errors because everything seems to be working properly. Um, there may be a user using a different system where that error is actually causing big problems. Um, so even if you don't think that error is like a showstopper, I, I highly encourage you to try to clean up any errors that your code might be generating. Uh, and then lastly, I wasn't really sure what other slide to put this on, uh, is gracefully handle zooming. Um, write good CSS so that if people are zooming in on your site to have the text be bigger, that sort of thing, that it doesn't completely fall apart. Uh, oftentimes you'll see like line height has been specified incorrectly or something like that and text starts to run together, become unreadable when it's been zoomed in. So that's that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, WordPress relevant stuff. I'm not going to spend long on this. Um, first of all, the WordPress admin, they work very hard to keep it uh, accessible. I believe it is conformant with WCAG 2.0 level AA um, out of the box. That doesn't mean that the plugins you're running are also doing that. Um, so if you need to care about accessibility in the admin, know that WordPress has got you covered for the basics, but uh, you need to check with your plugins in terms of what they're doing for the admin. Um, the theme directory um, does have a special flag in it for accessibility ready. Um, so that can help you if you're looking for themes in the WordPress theme directory. Uh, in terms of plugins, uh, there are a couple of keywords. The accessibility with the 11, the word accessibility, or WCAG can be good things to look for uh, when you're searching for plugins. Um, I'm not going to recommend specific plugins for you to install to do accessibility tests on your site. Um, that just depends too much on your site. And really, um, the most important thing is to test. Test, 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 test. So like, you know, try to meet the standard. You can run through some tools. I'm going to talk to you here for a minute. Um, but the only way to really know if something is a good experience for somebody is to have that somebody using your site uh, and have them tell you, you know, yes, you're up to standard, but it's really annoying. I have to hit tab four times or whatever, that sort of thing. So really quickly, um, some tools that we like to use at Corner Shop to help us uh, meet some of these standards and make sure you've got a good experience. The first one is a browser extension um, called Wave from webaim.org. Um, it's available for Chrome and Firefox, maybe some others. Uh, it's kind of old, um, but what you can do is you can bring up a particular URL uh, and then click the button and identify the standard and it'll go through and sort of add all these little tags and indicators to tell you, oh, hey, you know, you've got three H1s on the page. You've got three form fields without titles. You've got um, six images without alt tags, that sort of stuff. So it can go through and do an audit on a particular page. Um, this is great as sort of an entry point. Um, it's not automated for like going through a whole site. It's sort of page by page. But it, it's you know if you're getting started on the journey here, this is a great sort of first step uh, to figure out you know some low hanging fruit that you can address maybe very easily in your site, you know in your header and your footer or some stuff like that that you can just you know take care of very quickly. Another one we like is called Spectrum. 
Um, I know it's available for Chrome. I'm not sure what other browsers it's available for. Um, but what it does is it allows you to sort of simulate different, um, different color blindness uh, conditions. Um, and so you can toggle through these different things and see your site in a, like a low contrast mode uh, or any number of these uh, color blindness terms that I'm probably not going to pronounce properly, so I won't try. Um, but this can be really useful when you're working with a designer and the designer's like, oh, yes, the color contrast is right. And it's like, OK, but like, you know, let's take 30 seconds and click through these different things and see what happens and if things are horrible or not or if things start to blend together. Uh, and then another one is the contrast ratio analyzer. Um, so this is the thing I was talking about earlier where you can actually go in and it'll identify stuff and you can click on stuff and it'll tell you um, what sort of contrast ratio your type needs to have. Um, what's interesting about this is that the, the minimum ratio is different depending on how large the text is. Um, so it will tell you, you know, you need to have a contrast ratio of four to one if your text is small and two and a half to one if your text is a heading, um, that sort of stuff. So this makes it really easy. I mean, you can do this manually by like, you know, using some sort of color dropper in Photoshop or something like that. Um, but this is a nice sort of browser extension to help you with that. Um, there are other tools out there. Um, those are just the sort of the three that I wanted to highlight. Um, Lighthouse is a thing from Google that's built into DevTools. Uh, I think it's been mentioned in some other talks. Um, it's, it can audit a whole bunch of different stuff on a site, like performance and that sort of thing, but it also has some accessibility assessment sort of things. Uh, and then Axe um, from Dex Systems. Uh, it's, it's very similar to that Wave plugin. Uh, I think it's newer and has a more elegant sort of UI. Um, I personally haven't used it much because I'm a little behind the times, um, but it's the one that uh, people tell me I should be using. So I'm going to start using that one soon, I think. Uh, lastly, just a couple of things to keep in mind uh, around accessibility. Um, the first is that um, it's not binary. It's not like you have a site that is accessible or isn't accessible. Um, it's a spectrum. Um, sites can be more or less accessible for different people under different circumstances. Um, so it's, it's sort of a journey that's never complete. Um, it's not just sort of like, hey, we've checked the box for WCAG 2.0, hey, 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 we're done, we never need to think about this again. Um, like, it, it's complicated. Um, related to that, um, compliance is not everything. Yes, it can be great, and you might be required to meet a certain standard. Um, but the user experience, I've said this before, is what matters. The context matters. Um, what it's actually like for somebody with an accessibility issue um, is really what you need to care about at the end of the day. All of these standards are ways to force people to think about some of those issues. Um, but no one standard can sort of answer everything and be the end all. Um, and so with that in mind, every step is good. You know, if you do one thing after this talk and just get some alt tags in your images that you didn't have before, that's a positive step. Great. You've moved forward. Um, you know, don't feel like you have to do everything all at once and conform to everything. I mean, yes, we would be in a better world if we all took the time to do all of this stuff right all the time, and I, that would be great. Um, but every little bit you do, every user you gain, every person who gets a better experience is a good step, uh, even if you may not be where you want, you're not actually where you want to be at the end of the day. So that's it. That's what I had. Um, the link to the slide deck is up there at the top. Uh, I am Ben Byrne. My Twitter handle is Drywall. I'm not actually into construction. That's an old comic book character. Uh, and you can email me, ben at cshop.co or ben at cornershopcreative.com. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Do we have time for a question or two, or did I go too long? Yeah, we have time. Right. Anybody have a question? Want to come up to the mic? Hey, thank you for giving a talk. Uh, I, I had a question. I do zero design. I'm completely a developer. Yep. And uh, one component I get uh, asked to build a lot, three columns, you know, icon, title, content, then learn more link. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. So I think you know what my question is, but how would you approach that, especially since I'm not a designer? Would that be like an ARIA label, or what would your recommendations be? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, and I hate to punch it back to you in terms of context matters. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, for some of that stuff, when with some of those, some of that iconography is, you know, is almost just sort of like window dressing yeah. uh, and doesn't necessarily add critical value. I mean, it's like if that icon is used throughout the site with some sort of indicator, it has some meaning to it. Yeah. You might want to tag it and sort of try to give it more meaning for somebody. In, but if it's basically there as window dressing, you know, like if, you know, it's an SVG with an alt tag or something like that, that might be totally fine. Yeah. My 
question was more about like the learn more link that usually rests right, right below yeah, so that. So that's sort of like a click here, right? Yeah, the sort of like learn yeah. more link that doesn't. Um, yeah, I mean, in that case, I mean, what you might need to do is make sure that you're getting really good title attributes on that, on the, you know, if it's a button or an anchor or whatever, giving it a title to sort of contextualize what that learn more is about. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but it's better than just leaving it a learn more without a title. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. I actually have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really excellent presentation about automated testing and continuous integration. I was wondering if there's um, tools that, that check for accessibility that integrate with those. And I have a second question. Okay, um, so the answer to the first question is probably, but I don't know what they are. <laughs> I actually went to that talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, I know that, I mean, he mentioned Lighthouse, and Lighthouse does have an API and has some accessibility tests in it. Um, so I, I know that there's some stuff that can be done in that direction with Lighthouse, um, but I'm not an expert, I don't know. I'm sure there's a, a better answer out there that somebody can give you. <laughs> um, the, the second question is, um, this, one of the sites I work on, they publish a lot of reports that are in PDFs. And is there any kind of accessibility issues related to PDFs or kind of optimizing them that might might be useful? Um, yeah, there's that. I mean, there's probably get a whole separate talk on like PDFs and that sort of stuff. Uh, I mean, the, the first thing I would say is uh, make sure that the PDFs are just being made properly and that there's not, again, sort of that images of text problem. Um, you know, some search engines and stuff like that can go in and actually OCR a PDF that's not storing its contents of, as type. Um, but I mean, the, the first basic step there is make sure the PDFs are saved properly so the type is actually embedded in the PDF as type. Um, from there, I would say um, that's where it starts to get really fuzzy and complicated, depending on are you running some sort of third-party search tool that you want your PDFs to be searchable? Um, are you just concerned about once they're downloaded? You know, then it sort of becomes, you know, then it's no longer sort of a web issue and it's more of a like Acrobat reader issue and that sort of stuff. I don't know a lot personally about generating PDFs to be accessible themselves. Uh, most of my experience with that is making sure that the PDFs are indexable for search. Um, but I'm sure that there's a whole separate universe of designing for print and PDF that there are some good standards to follow there. Mm -hmm. Um, you touched on ARIA labels. I was wondering if you have a recommendation on a good place to learn more about how to do those properly on things. Um, not off the top of my head. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I can dig one up and tweet one out. Um, it's buried in my bookmark somewhere. Um, it's, it's like we actually, the work that we do at Corner Shop doesn't often necessitate that. Uh, and when we do, I, I have people that are doing it for me, basically. So uh, I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay, so. Um, yeah, so I forget what the acronym ARIA actually stands for. Somebody else in the room might actually know. Um, but again, the, the ARIA stuff is sort of extra markup you can put into your site, um, particularly around dynamic elements and components. Um, stuff that's being, you know, stuff that can get refreshed or stuff that's coming, you know, everybody's talking about like React and web apps and that sort of stuff. And ARIA starts to be really critical in that sort of stuff to indicate that like this is a progress bar or a loading indicator or, you know, this is something that will change every minute or this is like, um, you know, you wind up with pages with lots and lots of not so much text, but controls, right? Buttons to navigate or to change or whatever. And ARIA roles can really help differentiate, like if you've got a bank of 10 buttons, what they're actually functionally going to be doing, that sort of thing. Okay, so we're out of time. Maybe we can meet them at the happiness bar if there's any more questions. Yes, I will be at the happiness bar. Thank you. Al.